This is our 19th lesson in the book of Genesis. We'll commence, commence the 12th chapter tonight. I had shared with Brother, uh, Brother Gene that Alvin... I'm glad we're through with the first 11 chapters. It, it's not that I don't like them, you understand. Those kind of chapters are difficult to teach because you've got to see beneath the surface. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I, tr I trust that you did too. But there's scriptures like that that on the surface, you just you, there's nothing there. But there is underneath. And these first 11 chapters of Genesis prepare us now for the rest of the book. I teach you that it, how do I say this, that um, God isn't as interested in people as some think. That's a very clumsy way to say it, I'm trying to think of a better way to say it. Because in these first 11 chapters, God just paid attention to a handful of people. Adam, Abel, Seth, Enoch, and Noah. Now by... Uh, Reasonable calculations, there were actually billions of people that lived in that time span. And that's all the people God talked about. That's all the people God made himself known to. You learn something about God here. You've got to get on the wavelength with God. If you want something to happen between you and God, you've got to get on the same wavelength he operates on. Think all the people that died in the flood. How yeah. We went through just a very reasonable mathematical scenario that the flood occurred about 1650-something. We don't know, but it was roughly that about 1600 years had passed. And if the human race doubled every year, not every day, every year, Remember, people lived to be six, seven, eight, nine hundred years old. If it doubled every year for that time, you'd have over one trillion people. Just to kind of get, I don't know, I don't, wouldn't venture to say there were that many people, but I'm just sure there's a lot of people. It wasn't just a handful of people that passed away in the flood. So we're learning something about God that if you want God like to pay real lot of attention to you, and anyone with good sense does. <laughs> You've got to get where he wants you. And we're going to see that in this text here, as a matter of fact. This will be the calling of Abraham. We'll, we'll follow it up to when he enters into Canaan. First nine verses. Nine verses covers the calling of Cain, uh, Abram, Abram, the calling of Abraham, a long trip, and when he arrives in Canaan, there's nine verses devoted to that in the Bible. <laughs> well, you say, what can we learn from that? It's where you end up. That's what's important. Amen. Not what happens along the way. Well, here's our text. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. I will make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless thee and bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, 
and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed from Haran. <clears throat> and Abram took Sarah his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land under the place of Sikkim, unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, un, unto, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. I said, who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai, that's called Ai later in Joshua, on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. Now we're setting the stage for the rest of the Bible here. Just as you want to keep, uh, keep in mind. People who were informed, one of the big differences between the early church and the church of our day is the early church was informed about these things. They, they knew about this. Peter, priest of the day of Pentecost, he didn't have to have a long dissertation. They knew about They knew about this. They knew all this. They were a Bible people. That's how God raised Israel, a Bible people. Every Sabbath day for hundreds of years, up to this very day, they read Moses and the prophets every Sabbath day. Hmm? Are you aware of how many Gentile Christians don't have the slightest idea what's in the Bible? Are you aware of this? I'm painfully aware of it. This is not the kind of people God produces. Amen. Now a person can take the conclusion wherever he wants, but that's just the facts in the case. And even with the very early scriptures, most of them God was not pleased with. Was not pleased with. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's right. Even with that. Yeah. That's right. So you can mm -hmm. imagine a condition we're talking about. I want to nail this down again, the importance of this text. Everything's pointing out toward the coming of Christ. It started out, everything started out being pointed to Christ at, before Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. Before they were expelled, God told what he was going to do. Amen. The seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent, and the serpent will bruise his heel. Now, from that point on, everything's pointing to that event. He didn't say any more about this. He didn't tell Seth any more about it. He didn't tell Enoch any more about it. He didn't tell Noah any more about it. 16 years, 1600 years have passed and God hasn't said boo nor ba about this seed that's coming. But everything pointed toward that way. Now he's going to work with Abram. He's going to produce a nation. A cultured nation. This nation he's going to produce their entire life centers in God. If they had a picnic, it was a holy feast. If they had some kind of gathering, it was a feast unto God. If they met together, it was on the Sabbath day. They didn't lead personal lives like people do today. 100% of their life was toward God. They had a special language that was God-centered. This is the nation he's raising up into which Jesus is going to be born. There's no chance that Jesus would be born in Rome or Alexandria or Babylon. <laughs> no chance. He would not be raised in that kind of culture, nor would John the Baptist, nor would the prophets, nor would Moses. This nation was a cultured nation. Now, it wasn't, I, they, people weren't born again, you understand. 
they weren't ideal people, but God's produced you in this environment. Some people took advantage of the environment. There were some people that were holy. Yeah. Prophets were holy. Moses was holy. When Jesus came, John the Baptist's mother and father were old people, but they walked, they were blameless, walking in all the commandments of the Lord, blameless. See, they, they were they were holy people, took advantage of this environment. So that's what we're building toward is a, a nation in a chosen, in an isolated land. Israel was given their own land, stay with there. They weren't to be wandering all over the world. Stay in that land, and I, it's a crossroads. People will come to you. All of this is in preparation now for the Messiah. I'll tell you, if God had done this, I, I don't know how, where'd you, where, where would Jesus have been born? What, what would have been the circumstances? Would there have been a holy man like Joseph and a young woman that kept herself pure and knew, and knew God well enough to recognize when they God had talked to her. Would there have been somebody like this that just would have cropped up? No, there wouldn't have been. That's right. Amen. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're building toward here. So important to see that. See, when the new covenant was inaugurated, Peter just started out preaching what the prophets said, <laughs> and everybody listening knew what the prophets had said. Nobody said, "Well, we never read it. We never read Joel. It is a little bitty book, you know." There's a lot of Christians that have never read the book of Joel. But there wasn't any Jew that hadn't. They knew what it said. They had read the Psalms, and he'd quote from Psalms, you know, day of Pentecost. Now we're going to find out how God ended up with a nation like that. Only God could do this. Amen. Yeah. Only God could do this. If God had just started the thing and then backed off, it would have... It wouldn't have worked. So we're going to see God's going to be interjecting himself, imposing himself, whether people wanted him to or not. Right. Abraham never did seek God. Yes, right. God sought him. In fact, he was an idolater when God found him. So we're learning this about <laughs> your salvation is on a real solid foundation if you can see all of these things. Now, the nature of God is accented here. <clears throat> God was going to create a people through whom the Savior could come so he could, so he could create. Yeah. He's going to adapt people to himself. God is not going to change, modify himself to please men. God will not change his plan to suit men. God doesn't come along men and say, I want to help you do what you are planning to do. He's going to create a people that will get involved in what he's doing. And this is going to be how he does it. Now let's take a look at Abram for just a, just a brief moment. <laughs> Abram is an example. Abram, he was later called Abraham. Abraham. You must know this, but the young, some of the young don't know this. His name was Abram, and God said he's going to be a father of many nations, and Abraham, that's what that meant, father of many nations. <coughs> Abraham is going to be a key person in the Bible. If you want to know what faith is, God's going to point you to Abraham. He's going to be the pre preeminent example of what real faith mm -hmm. is. Yes. Real faith doesn't need a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right? You could take all of the words that God said to Abraham, mm -hmm. and you'd have no trouble at all putting them on this card. Uh -huh. yeah. That's right. No trouble at all. Mm -hmm. Every word God said to me, you could write it. Faith doesn't need a lot of information. In Christ, you do get a lot of information, but that's why you should be a lot further along Amen. than people that lived back in former, former times. He's going to be the premier example of faith. He's going to point, we're going to point you back to him, say, you want to know if you have faith? Do you react to God's word like Abraham did? 
When he says move, do you move? Yeah. What do you do? Now, actually, we don't know very much about Abraham prior to this. I'll give you everything we know about Abraham prior to this event. He was born to Tira after Tira was 70 years old. He took to himself a wife named Sarai, who was barren. He went with his father, Tira, and his nephew, Lot, and Sarai from Ur of the Chaldees. He came with that group to Haran, where he dwelt, and where Tira, his father, died. All right, now up to this point, that's all you know about Abraham. So for the first 75 years of his life, you got four things. What? Two, three, yeah, four. You got four things after 75 years of his life. What does that tell you? It means that your life really started when you were connected with the Lord. Amen. That's really when living started. Up to then, it was just, just so much. You, know? <laughs> you can sum it up in a few words. You'd think something was bad wrong if you were 75 and we only knew four things about you, wouldn't you? You'd say, whoa, what's going on? she no more about, but that's all because God doesn't want you to think about Abram in connection to before he was in yeah. called of God. God doesn't want you to be thinking about what Abram was. It's what he was, what he became after God come in contact with him. Yet when, whenever God talks about Abraham or Abram, he speaks as though he's well known. Prophets talked about him, Moses talked about him, Jesus talked about him, Paul talked about him. See, they all talked about him as always well known, but he's not well known because there's just such an abundance of things about him. There's a lesson to be learned here. There's a remarkable parallel with believers coming to Christ and being found in him. <coughs> The scriptures are going to tell us, the preceding chapter says, Terah, his father, took Abram and Sarah and Lot and went to Haran. But the, our text is going to tell you that God brought them there. Brought them out early. And I'm going to show you from the scriptures how that the apostles preached that God brought him out of Ur of the Chaldees and out of Haran. Now, the parallel is this. <clears throat> Here's what Stephen said about this, just to, to confirm this. Acts 7.21. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abram when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charon, which is translated Haran. Remember our text, it says, when the, our text began, the Lord had said unto Abram. It's back when he was in or the Chaldees. The call took place while Abraham was Abram was still in Ur. Mm -hmm. yeah. When it was, we we don't know. We don't know when it was. We don't know how old he was. God told him, get get out. Now you're gonna have to leave several things. You're gonna leave your father's house. You're going to have to leave the city of Ur. You're going to have to leave the region of Chaldea, Ur of the Chaldees. You're going to have to leave the land of Mesopotamia. You're going to have to get out of that hole. You're going to have to get out of, out of that region. And I'm going to take you to a land I'll show you. He doesn't even know where he's going. Right. Which direction to go? <laughs> Seven now he's, He's, he's a mature man, probably in his near 70 somewhere. Now, what kind of person would obey a thing like that? I mean, would you? Are you doing examining yourself? You have to think this thing through. If God told you, I'm not, I'm not saying God will do this, but I'm not saying he won't either. If God says, pull up and leave. Leave your relatives, leave your city. Leave the county, leave the state. It, along the way, I'll tell you where you're going. Would you, would you do it? 
Faith will. Amen. Listen, brethren, there's a lot of people that you know, maybe some of you, that God has spoken to their hearts, get off your duff and start moving. Uh -huh. And here they sit. They're not... I'm not talking about a physical movement. I'm, I'm talking about they, they know they should be further along. They know they should cut some ties, but they just haven't done it. Abraham did it. Amen. God appeared. To, see, that John the Baptist, here's another example of a man did this. He couldn't lead a normal life. He didn't have a normal diet. Right? And the scripture says that he was he was a child, grew and waxed strong in spirit, was in the deserts till the day of his showing to Israel. So God just isolated him. I tell you now, this I know this doesn't sit well with some people, but you don't want to really argue with this because this I could really substantiate this without any trouble at all. God uses a person to the extent they're separated from the world. Yep. If they're all involved in the world, I can tell you right now, God's not going to use them. If he does, it'll be very minimal. We don't have any example of this kind of thing in the Bible. He isolated Israel. He isolated John the Baptist. There is this necessity of separation. Before God uses a person, he separates them. It's consistent all through Scripture. Noah, for 120 years, you're not going to be a world traveler. You're going to be hammering and building on an ark for 120 years. He isolated him off. You're going to do the same thing with Abraham. Now, the, the Scriptures, this should not be strange to us. The Scriptures tell us in 2 Corinthians 6.17, be ye separate. All right, and you say, what does that mean? That's your business to find out what that means. I could tell you what it means, but that's not, that's your business. The words come from the king to all believers. Be separate. Well, now, now if you take that seriously, you set out, well, I'm going to find out what that means. And I'm going to do it because you're not going to go to another step till that happens. Abram wasn't going to get any further direction till they got out of that situation. I know you can see that. Amen. And then Paul, he announces, well, Jesus told his disciples, I've chosen you out of the world. John 15, 19. And Peter, when he was explaining the Gentiles' acceptance of the gospel, he said that God visited the Gentiles to take out, to take out of them a people for his name. His separation, this is what it's all about. Amen. Now, you've got a church today that's saying you've got to become part, you've got to mess with the world. This is a lot of baloney. Yeah, that's right. Amen. This cannot be substantiated. This is just because the churches are dwindling, attendance is dwindling, and this is their plan to try and beef things up a little bit. Amen. Separation is the point. Why? Because God's going to condemn the world. Whoever doesn't believe on him will be damned. That's what Jesus said. So I've got to break loose. <laughs> i got to get loose from this, and the world's coming down itself. So in Christ, we become a non-worldly people. He said, don't love the world. Don't love the things that are in the world. Don't, and it, see, it's easy to develop this because it's being flashed before you all the time, marketed to you all the time. Separate from ourselves. That's right. Deny yourself. Amen. Take up your cross and follow after you. The point I'm seeking to develop here is that if you want to hear from God, you got to get in this separated status. Mm -hmm. yeah. Otherwise, you'll be dumb as an ox about the things of God. Okay. Just recently, I've heard more of uh, churches on Sunday having work day 
where they go out and help people. Instead of having services, they go out into the yeah. world to let their light shine yeah. and, and forfeit meeting with the Lord so that they could go, yeah. in the name of the Lord, go help people. Yeah, you can't shine if you put your light under a bushel. Well, I know some people say, well, I have to, the building is a bushel. The building is a bushel? Does a temple a bushel? Don't listen to people say stuff like this. These are dumb people. I'm telling you the truth. Jesus was the light of the world, and you wanted to find him every day? He's in the temple. Amen. He was going to say, folk, we've got to get out of the temple. We've got to get out of these four walls. I say it's about time to get Christ inside the four walls. Then some light can kind of... Yeah, he didn't go out to the marketplace. He made the marketplace leave yeah. the temple. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> For the given. Yeah. I was also thinking about this, too, that when the emphasis is on separation and people don't want to do that is because they haven't joined themselves to the Lord. That's because right. Because when you join yourself to the Lord, you will be separate yeah. from what you were Amen. with. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And it's not an unpleasant thing. I mean, it's not, right. your life won't be miserable <laughs> Because you did it, the Lord will give you more than the than the world ever did. Amen. So it's not like uh, you go to heaven in a state of misery. It's not that. It's not that sort of thing. Now God is going to be working in Canaan, right? That's where that's where Jesus is going to be born in that land. That's where the Pentecost is going to happen in that land. That's where Paul's going to be raised up in that land. Everything's going to be going to go out from Canaan. So in other words, Ab Abram's got to get to the land where God's going to do the work. Can you see that? I'm going to show you the land. I was, it, the land is going to show him is the land all this stuff's going to happen in. So separate unto it. The land of Canaan, well, there's a lot of references to it in the scripture, hundreds of them. It's called, I'll just mention some of the names, it's called the sanctuary. It's called the land of Israel. The land of the Hebrews, there's a battling today about who's the land belonged to. Unfortunately, we have a president that doesn't acknowledge what God said. We have had some presidents that they do, <laughs> whose land it was. Called the land of promise, the holy land, the Lord's land, Emmanuel's land, the land of Beulah. God calls it my land. And a number of times it's referred to as his land. As a matter of fact, he's kicked people out of his land who defiled it. That's why the Canaanites got thrust out. They defiled his land. So you got to get where God's working <laughs> if you're going to participate. You can see that. Get to the place of God's choosing. Where Now here's how everybody in Christ starts out. Everybody starts out this way. They're raised up and made to sit together with Christ in heavenly places, right? That's where everybody, that's where, that's where they start out. Everybody starts out being added to the Lord. Everybody starts out being joined to the Lord. Everybody starts out being baptized into Christ. Everybody starts out in a certain place. Separation is staying in that place. Whatever lures you out, this is intensely personal, but this is part of you working out your salvation. Whatever lures you out of that place, you don't listen to it. Whatever, and this is a big place, so you're lure, when you're set in heavenly places, you're not set in the middle. You're set like right on the edge. When Israel entered into Canaan, there was right, I mean, the non-Canaan was there, Canaan was here. That's where he sits you, right on the edge. You're inside, but now the purpose is get to the middle. Now, if you look at the land of Canaan, Jerusalem was like in the middle. You want to get to Jerusalem, you had to get to the land that's down here in Judah at about the middle. Get where God is working. You'll know it when there's results begin to be produced in you. See, that's how you can tell. When, when what God asks you to be and do, you're, you're being and doing, then that, that tells you you're in the right place. See, We're not talking about a physical place here. You understand? Sometimes it is associated with a physical place, but it's God that sanctifies the place. Amen. And you get further revelation along the way to this. 
To this point in Genesis, God has not told him that Canaan's where he is the land. He just said, I'll show you the land. Get out and go to the land. I'll show you the land. After you leave. After you leave her of the Chaldees, I'll show you where the land is. And he ended up in Haran, and he still didn't know the land. Apparently, God would, wasn't saying anything at that time. So he stayed there till he, till he got the next word. The next leg of his journey was from Haran to, she to Shechem in Canaan. So further revelations given along the way. That's how it was with Israel. They left Egypt. They had no idea where they were going. They didn't know where they were going. God led them along the way. He led them with a cloud, a pillar by day, a pillar of fire by night, and he led them. <laughs> then they got close to the land. They said, that, that's it. That's it there. That's the way the Lord leads you. He doesn't tell you how this all going to end up right away or what's, what's going to happen to you. He might tell you, like some of us, like a wife died, a couple of children died. <laughs> he didn't tell me all this stuff up in front. Uh -huh. But following the Lord is worth it. Yes. Amen. It's worth going through that. Because see, in Christ, there is not really a permanent separation in the first place. Amen. He that believes on me will never die, Jesus said. Amen. The point to be seen is that divine guidance takes place while we're in the way. Not in the way like obstacle in the way, but on the way. On this highway that Isaiah talked about, highway of holiness. There's a sense in which revelation follows separation. And it sort of compensates. It, as we don't pretend here. Separation is not pleasant. <laughs> That's what if anyone thinks that, that the demand to be separate is like a pleasant, it's not. Pleasant situation. But what happens after the separation compensates for the, for the separation. I don't imagine it was any easier for Abraham to leave his father's house and the land he was reared in and the region he was in and the Mesopotamia area he was in. I don't imagine it was any easier for him than it had been for anybody else. But it was, he knew if I want to hear from God, I got to, God's not going to direct me here because this, this isn't where he's going to be doing his work at all. And then he promises, he made some promises. He just, this is what he said before he was in hearing. God had said this. This is what prompted him to believe Ur of the Chaldees. Our text has him. He's in Haran now, in our text. I'll make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. Make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Wow. That's, uh, <laughs> that's staggering. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Great, not in the eyes of the world. Yeah. Not, not numerically. But more is going to come out of this nation, Abram, than you ever dared to imagine. Yeah. Amen. This nation is going to produce men like Moses and Joshua and Solomon and David and the holy prophets. They're not going to have a Socrates and a Plato like Greece. They won't have mathematicians like Egypt had. They won't have architectural experts like Greece did. But this is going to be a great nation. There's going to be things come out of here that the world has never conceived. Great nation. God's going to reveal himself to this, these people. He's going to speak to them through people in this nation like Moses and the prophets. Now the thing that determines what's great and what it means to be blessed and what it means to be a blessing is determined by what God's doing. It's directly associated with that. Now if you were to define the word bless you'll find it's quite a challenge. 
what the word means. Bless. I gave you some academic things there, but they won't be satisfying. What does it mean? I will bless. I will bless thee. Well, I, I searched all of the lexicons, all the dictionaries, and come up with just about zero. I, you do it. Just see if you can just go to the library and hunt up the word bless, see what you find. It'd be to benefit you and give you a, some kind of an advantage, either temporal or spiritual. It's all, all very general. So I said, well, I'm not going to spend time plowing in this field because I can see there's nothing there. So I'm going to, I'm going to make an attempt to define bless. So I'm going to go to the book. Amen. What does it mean to bless? That's what, I will bless thee. What does that mean? Make you laugh? Make you smile? Somebody says, Bless means be happy. Well, there's this, there's this sense in which it does mean that. But is this, is this what God been when he told us? I'm going to bless you. You'll be a smiling man. You'll be, noticed as a happy, you'll be known as a happy person. Is this what he meant? All right, here the Lord said to Moses, he wanted the people of Israel to be blessed. The Lord said unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel. <clears throat> saying unto them. All right, here it is. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. All right, that's, let's look at that. That's, that's blessing. Blessing that involves being kept by God. Yeah. Bless thee and keep thee. Be kept by God. That's, that's involved in being blessed. It involves making his face shine upon them. That is, something more of him is seen. Mm -hmm. When God makes his face shine upon you, you just like don't study the stars and the moon and all this. You see more of him. And what about being gracious unto you? That means he's merciful toward you, and he, gi he gives you more, and he, you're closer to him, and he's more uh, attentive to you, and he's more interested in you than gracious unto you. And lift up his countenance upon you. That is, he's looking at you. When you're oppressed, he, he takes note of it. When someone treats you well, he takes, takes note of it. his countenance. Is, he's looking at you. Now, for a person who's not in right relationship with God, that's a scary thing. God's looking at you. But when you're walking in the way and you're keeping his commandments and they're not grievous to you and you're doing your best you can for the Lord, oh, the thought of God seeing you. <laughs> that compensates for all the trouble that's stirred up when you start serving God. Give you peace. See if this is what blessing is. Mm -hmm. You're in an unstable world. Mm -hmm. There's all kind of tumult going on all around. Yeah. But blessing is when you're you're settled down. It's like Jesus during the storm, he's asleep in the boat. Didn't bother him, bothered the disciples. Didn't bother him. That's a little bit of what's involved in giving peace, being blessed. But see, even, even that's just... You think God says there's much more than this, but bless, I will bless thee. Above other people, he's saying. Hmm. I'm going to bless thee. Now, I'm going to make your name great, Abram. Now, people are going to hear your name. They're going to be thinking a lot of things. Now, it's not great like Socrates, great philosopher. He's not talking about that sort of thing. I'll make thee great. Not great in the eyes of men. You'll be great in the eyes of people who know me. They'll know who you are. They'll talk about you, Abram. Way up into history, 4,000 years in advance, there'll be people assembled all over the world, and they'll talk about you. They'll, you'll minister to them. They'll hear about you, and all their hearts will be lifted up. I'm going to make your name 
great. I'm very concerned about any group of Christian people that don't talk a lot about Abraham. I'm very suspicious. So his fame would be written into the framework of divine working. And when God worked, Abraham would fit into the revelation about that work. And he said, um, and you'll be a blessing. Well, it's one thing to be blessed. It's another thing to be a blessing. You'll be a blessing. You will give advantage to people. When people think about you and see you, they'll be the better for it. I'll make you a blessing. There's a couple of hymns that have been written based on this verse. One is called Make Me a Blessing. And the other is a channel of blessing. And if you had sung hymns for a while, you'll remember those songs. They're based on this text of Scripture. When they saw what God did, they said, we, I want to be a blessing too. Amen. I want to be a blessing. Amen. You know, you see, there's some people, when you see them in Walmart, you, you head for the pharmacy section. There's other people, when you see them, you light up and you want to, what's the difference? One's a blessing and one isn't. <laughs> I said, see, there's some people that they are, they are such a blessing you can see them in their car. Yeah, right. Nothing passed between you and them and all your whole day is changed. Yeah, yeah, right. Why? They're a blessing. Yeah, Brother Jim, I did that now. It's been a while, but you're coming out of the eye doctor down, <laughs> downtown. Yeah. I was tired, it was hot, <laughs> and I seen you coming out, and all of a sudden I just perked up. Yeah, and I saw you, and I perked up. <laughs> <laughs> Burner had a traffic jam right there. <laughs> but you can be a blessing. You can. Like some people think that what God really is doing, he's making policemen. It would be a good policeman, be able to find all the faults to everybody. Well, that's too easy of a job. Be a blessing. If people are blessed, a lot of their faults will fall off, so to speak. I'll make you a blessing. <laughs> Amen. And this isn't going to end here, Abraham. Abram, they're going to end here. I'm going to, I'm going to treat other people like they treat you. Oh, here's a thought. Huh? I'll bless them that bless thee, and I'll curse them that curse thee. You believe that could happen to a person? Why do you think God says, don't avenge yourselves? Yeah. Because vengeance belongs to him. I'll, he'll curse them that curse them. You don't have to do anything about it. Amen. Some people may say things, do things bad to you. You, may, you can't be vindictive. You can't take matters into your own hands. God will handle that. He may handle it differently than you. He may convert Saul of Tarsus. Amen. <laughs> amen. Huh? Yeah, amen. I'll bless them that bless thee. What about people who don't know anything about Abraham? That are they're in they're supposedly in Christ, but they don't know anything about Abraham. They don't know his role in the scheme of redemption. Well they're they're, they, they're not being as blessed as they could be. Let's put it that way. It's the same condition that God, our, our, remember, I'll bless them, bless them, curse them, and curse them. God stated this same thing a number of times to different people. Here's what he said to Jacob. <clears throat> Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren. Let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee. Blessed be he that blesseth thee. <laughs> As to Jacob, that's some years later, same thing. The old covenant itself made with Israel said, I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary to thine adversaries. It's the same, same principle. Part of Balaam's prophecy to Balak was blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. See, that's, that's a prophecy Balaam gave. Christ's words, he said to 
The king shall answer and say unto them, I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto me, unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done unto me, and he says to the goats, Inasmuch as ye did it not unto one of the least of these, ye did it not unto me. See, this principle carries through all through Scripture. Now, I've heard a lot of people emphasize the fact that God loves, loves us, and he does love us with a great love. Make no mistake about it. Well, how about this is an aspect of love? I'll bless them that bless them, thee, and curse them that curse thee. That's how close you are to God. Yeah. Want to know how close you are in Christ to God? That's how close. God can say something like this. The principle Jesus gave to his apostles on this wise, he said, uh, he that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Boy, that, that opens the door there. I'm saying, where are some prophets? I want to receive the prophets. He that receives a prophet will have a prophet's reward. And whosoever shall give a drink unto one of these little ones, a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. See, that's, that's how extensive this is. About blessing and bless thee, curse him and curse thee. You say, well, that was Abraham. Well, you're related to Abraham. We're all the children of Abraham by faith. Is what the scripture says. Abraham's the father of us all. So it does, it pertains to us in our measure. And in thee, now he gets down to the root of the matter. In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Abram, up to this point, not many people know about you. Before I'm done, I'm going to bless all families of the earth through you. Did God do something like this? Well, he did. Later he said to Abraham, same thing, fortified it. In thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. There it is, stated again. Again God said to Abraham, In thy seed, these, in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. He's, he's repeating it years later. He says to Jacob, In thee shall in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. <laughs> Peter he preached in Acts 3 ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers saying to Abraham in thee in thy seed shall all kindreds of the earth be blessed there it is again to this one man Paul he wrote that the gospel was first preached to Abraham how that God would justify the heathen through the faith, priest before the gospel of Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. That's the gospel. That's right. All right, now this is a new piece of revelation that's not been made known unto this time. Adam and Eve, the only thing they knew was the serpent was going to be defeated. That, that, that's it. That's it. They didn't know anything else. For 1,600 years, this is all the world knew. It'll be Enoch, he told Enoch sometime later, so I'm going to judge. So with this aspect of God, condemnation, judge. Told Noah, same thing, this aspect of God, condemnation. So you have Satan's going to be bruised, world's going to be judged. This, this, this is it. Now, now a new perspective is given that's never before been announced. There's going to be a blessing. Mm -hmm. yeah. The whole world's going to be blessed. Mm -hmm. See? Abraham's closer. He can hear better, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So he's going to announce this. This is going to be a blessing. That's what it is. Twice in the scriptures, the blessing of Abraham. That phrase is used two times in the Bible. The blessing of Abraham. Text we just read says it was the gospel was preached. It was the gospel was preached to him. 
The gospel isn't God has a wonderful plan for your life. Yeah. The gospel is there's, a, there's something that's going to bless all kindreds of the earth. Mm -hmm. This is going to be as wide as the transgression. However far the transgression affected humanity, this, what I'm going to do, is going to go that far and further. Amen. Yeah. Is there any place where sin dominates that this can't be announced? Uh -huh. I'll bless all families of the earth through your seed. Mm -hmm. Through the person that's going to eventually come from your lineage, yeah. I'm going to bless the whole world. Amen. Now, th all of that was said to Abram before he left Ur of the Chaldees. <laughs> <laughs> now he's in Haran. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, which I gather this has to be a second time he spoke to him. Because he'd already obeyed the first one. Get the other father's house. He already had laid Mesopotamia. He'd already done that. So this has to be another time that he spoke to him, which isn't spelled out in Scripture. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abraham was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. <laughs> so they went from Ur of the Chaldees to Haran. 11th chapter ended, they, they dwelt there for a while. Now it's, it's 800 miles from Ur of the Chaldees to Haran by foot. With herds and flocks and servants and whatever. 800 miles. And it's going to be 700 miles from Haran to Shechem. So this little jaunt that God called Abram out on was 1,500 mile walk. Now these days they talk a lot about prayer walks, but there's none of them 1,500 mile long. And he was directed. He had to be. He said, I'll show you. Mm -hmm. So when he goes to Mur of the Chaldees, if he goes southwest, he's going to end up in Egypt. Mm -hmm. If he goes east, he's going to end up in India. Yeah. How did he know which way to go? Mm -hmm. Some way God showed him. That's right. Amen. We don't know it, but God showed him some way. Right yes? I was just thinking about that. Just I don't think we even compre can comprehend how much faith Abraham That's had. Right. Because you think about that, now he had to walk, and then right. he had to he had to have enough faith to know he would be sustained That's all the right. time. Because you're going through a, a wilderness territory, yeah. like the southern Judea is called the wilderness of Judea. So you're going; it's not like plush land <laughs> at the time. So, in my judgment, this uh, this he left can't be referring to a word spoken to him when he was in Ur, because he'd already left Ur of the Chaldees. Well, we, we have a word from this. See, this. Stephen, he knew this. Here's what Stephen said in Acts 7, 2 through 4. Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Charon. See, so he spells it out. And said unto him, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, come unto the land which I will show thee of. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Charon. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him. What, what, what? He, God, removed him. Yeah, yeah. Into this land wherein you now dwell. So here, in both of these instances... It says that the record in Genesis 11 said, Terah took Abram, Sarah, and Lot with him. The apostle said, God brought him out of earth. <laughs> See that? God brought him out. Our text says that Abram left Terah and Lot went with him. Stephen said, God took him out. This is how scripture talks. It tells you from the practical viewpoint what, according to sight, happened. Then it tells you what, what actually happened behind the scenes. 
And Lot, yeah, now the scripture at Hebrews 11 says he went out not knowing whether he went. Still, at this time, he still, God hasn't mentioned Canaan. At this, at this point, Canaan has not been mentioned yet. And Lot went with him. Now, some people have criticized Abraham at this point. They have said, he said to leave your father's house, and there he did, went, went and took him with him. Should have never done that. Oh, I've, I can't tell you how many sermons I've heard on this. People today don't know the Bible too well, so one relief is they don't say things like that because they don't know the scriptures well enough. But Lot, but God brought him out, and Lot, we shouldn't surprise us that some of his relatives went with him. When Israel came out of Egypt, there was a mixed multitude of Egyptians that went with him. And God didn't say, hey, Moses. Tell those Egyptians to go back home. They had no right to come with us. They came with them. And when God was behind us, what I'm saying, God was behind us. <coughs> if he wasn't there, the Holy Spirit would have edited this remark. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now let me give you some example of how when somebody said something or did something and it didn't look right, the Holy Spirit would edit what happened and tell you what was behind it. So I'll give you just a couple examples here. When all the cities through which Israel passed didn't let them through. Some of them, some of them let them pass through peaceably and some wouldn't let them. All right, here's what the scripture says about that in Joshua 11.20. It was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly and that they might have no favor but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. And if you, uh, Joshua will tell you that God hardened the heart of Sihon and Og. So God is behind this action. Here, here's another one. Samson, he sought a wife from the Philistines that upset his parents. And they said, well, you should have seek a wife from among your kindred, which is what God had taught the people. Don't mingle with the heathen. I mean, you could cite all kind of scriptural verses for this. And so they told him not to do this, but then the Holy Spirit adds this remark. His father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord, that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So see, <laughs> it's remarkable when you see this, because sometimes things happen they're out of your control, and you wonder, why did that? Yeah. You've got to believe that the same God that was working back then is working today, and he doesn't always tell you what he's doing. Uh -huh. Once Caiaphas, the high priest, he tried to justify killing Jesus by saying, if we kill him, then the nation, that, that we won't lose our place, the Romans won't come against us. And so, but the Holy Spirit edits his remarks. Here's what he said. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. <laughs> so that's not what Caiaphas meant, but see, that's what I'm saying is if Abram had been disobedient by taking Lot, the Holy Spirit would have commented on that. This is what he does uh, in Scripture. Now there's other precedents for this. As I mentioned to you, they took some of the Egyptians, went with Israel out of Egypt. And here's one, Moses, they're on the en route to the Promised Land, and he says something to his brother-in-law. He says, we are journeying unto a place of which the Lord said, I will give it you. Come thou with us. Come thou with us. We will do thee good, for the Lord has spoken good concerning Israel. See, so this, this wouldn't be wrong to say, Lot, do you come too? This wouldn't have been wrong. No more wrong than it would be for you to say to someone who's lost, come and go with us. God has spoken well about people that believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't. Come on, come on, go with us. Right. He'll bless you. And the very idea of a proselyte. The scriptures mention some proselytes. Cornelius was a proselyte. 
One of the seven deacons were, was a proselyte. The very idea of a proselyte tells you that it's not wrong to have someone from the outside come in here and join in the journey. See? So no, it was not wrong. In his journeys for the Lord, God would send him someplace and he'd take companions with him. It wasn't wrong. So I conclude it wasn't wrong for Abram to take Lot with him. So Abram went forth, <coughs> took Sarah, Sarai, his, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions, all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, they went forth. Now there's no evidence that Sarah balked at this. Then we moving again, Abram. We just kind of get settled in and we're moving again. You know, that sounds foolish. So you're aware of the fact that some people say that when God said to Eve, thy desire shall be thy husband, that what that text means is the woman has this desire to compete with her husband and wants to control. In fact, there's some Bible versions that actually say this. You see, you know, I'm not just saying this. Here's the uh, New Living Translation. You will want to control your husband but he will dominate you. Well, that's a net Bible, excuse me. Here's the, here's the do living translation. You will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. See, so that's all right. So if you're, you're a fan of translations, what do, you, like, what do you do with stuff like this? These aren't translations. These aren't even Bibles. Yeah, right. They impose their own understanding on the text, and as soon as they did... The word of God ceased to be the word of God. Amen. That's what Jesus told the Pharisees and scribes. Their tradition nullified the word of God. But there are some people that still, they teach this. But Sarah stands up and says, well, you read my record. You didn't read anything about me doing this. Right. In fact, that she was subject to Abraham. Points, Peter makes a point of it. He even called him Lord. That's right. Yeah. Oh, hey, <laughs> Now, remember, they took Sarah, Abram, and their, their household, which includes all the servants, all the cattle, all the herds, everything. So they were obviously industrious men. Said they gathered this stuff at Haran. When they stayed at Haran, they increased their possessions, and they picked up a lot of servants. Scripture doesn't say they were slaves. I mean, they, need, they were needed to herd the cattle and things like this. And later on, we find that Abraham had 318 trained servants that they didn't need leadership. They could fight. So, oh, here come these several hundred people. <laughs> you got to get the picture here. Several hundred people, all these cattle, all this livestock, and a lot of possessions, they're moving along on this little 700-mile trek from Heron. They're obviously going to have to stop along the way and pitch their tents. And, huh? You should be familiar with this. You're making a journey, too, you know. So they were industrious. It reminds me of that parable Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a man who went away into a far country and dispensed his goods to his servants to handle while he was gone. And so Abraham and Lot, they increased what they had. Even though from the standpoint of traveling, it looked like this would not be the wise thing to do. I mean, if you're t taking a long trip, you'd think you wouldn't keep piling stuff in the car. At some point, you'd kind of cut out. But that, that's not what they did. They kept on increasing. Right. Yeah, but they were giving some of these tents. 
I was looking just the yeah. last week at some of these tents <laughs> that um, they still live in. Some yeah, of these no, nomadic tribes kidding. still live in. And, and from the pictures, you wouldn't even guess it was a tent. Yeah. It looked exactly <laughs> like a house almost. And, and yet from the outside, it was yeah, large, large tents, very large, yeah. yeah. No, Brother Gibbon, it's, it's interesting because Abraham never did settle down That's in the right. land that God promised him. Right. In fact, the scripture says, by faith he sojourned in the sojourned land of promises. Sojourned in the, in well the land of promises in a strange land. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that now Abraham, he didn't, uh, he continued to grow. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and prosper. <laughs> I mean, he, he picked up uh, a lot more stuff and he mm -hmm. hired some more servants That's right. to take care of it. But you know, it never did distract him <laughs> from what he was doing. He still, when the Lord said, move, he got up. Yeah. Uh -huh. See, that you know you got too much stuff when you can't move. Mm -hmm. yeah. When the Lord calls you further and it's too hard to go, you got to start dropping off some stuff. You got too much stuff. Yeah. So it doesn't mean you just have enough to put in your pockets. Because you can have a lot of stuff and handle it right. Yeah. Handle it well. Amen. I was saying, I was say, Abraham never did settle in on this earth. That's right. Amen. Yeah. But his faith was settled. That's right. Amen. Amen. He used the world but didn't abuse it. Yeah. The world didn't have him. So the lesson, of course, we can learn from this is in newness of life, we're much like Abraham. We're leaving the world and headed for the glory, accumulating some things along the way that we can keep when we get to the glory. <laughs> oh, that's quite a picture, isn't it? Now it says when they got there, so at some point God finally said, this is, we're here now. The Canaanite was in the land. Well, God hadn't told him he was leading him to a land that was occupied. He didn't, he didn't tell him that. Didn't tell you either how much was in the land where you're headed. It might have scared you. Yeah. Now, there's no accounts of Ab God appearing to Abram along the way, but there's some way in which he directed him. We just we don't know how it was. Stephen appears to allude to this period of time when he says, he, then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, dwelt in Charon, and from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into, his, into this land where you now dwell, and he gave him non-inheritance in it. So that's this, no, the Brother Ricky was talking about, this nomadic wandering. No, not so much as to set his foot on, yet he promised that he would give it to him as for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. So he, God's been talking about seed and all this, and he hadn't had, Abraham doesn't have a child yet. Canaanite was in the land. Now it says that he, he came to a place of Sikkim, later that's called Shechem, unto the plain of Moray, and the Canaanite was in the land. I want to read you what some uh, other versions say here. He traveled till he went through the land. Just a minute here. Yeah. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Mori, the site of the great tree at Mori, at Shechem, till it came to Shechem to the holy tree of Mori. I'm reading from Bible versions. Mm -hmm. Into the place of Shechem as far as the noble vale, the place of Shechem and under the plain of Mori, the place of Shechem unto the terebinth of Mori, the place of Shechem to a high oak, the holy place at Shechem, the oak of Mori, as far as Shechem, there he set up camp beside the oak of Mori, as a sacred tree of Mori in a place called Shechem, to the locality of Shechem, to the oak or terebinth tree of Mori. I don't know, how would you know, like, know what, what to pick? The terebinth was a certain kind of tree. I'll give you a picture of it here. 
And the word uh, translated plain has a variety of meanings. I think I give it here somewhere. It has a variety of meanings. One is plain, is another. One is this terabyte by three, and terabyte is a transliteration of the word translated plain. You just would really take the letters and just translate letter by letter into the English without it, because there's no English word to match it. So that's so there's what you have that he can't uh, keep in mind now. A tree with hundreds of people and flocks and herds camping under it. I mean, let's get serious here. I just don't like it when people take, they go dictionary crazy and lexicon crazy. They don't use their mind. The word plain is proper. All scholars will say, well, yeah, there is, that, there's nothing wrong with the word plain. So if there was a tree, it was in a plain. That's how I look at it. So they came to this plain. Now for the first time, the Lord appears. He appears to Abram. You're in the land now. You've walked through a considerable part of it. The Lord appears to him. That is in some external manner. It was his glory, some some external way unto thy seed will I give this land I tell you that uh, keep in mind how much Abraham knew now uh, he doesn't have any children yet <laughs> keep that in mind I'm going to give this land to your seed this is God talking so if you think that land doesn't have any value. Well, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about dirt, uh -huh. real estate, uh -huh. real estate. Lord came to Abram and told him this. This is the first recorded incident of God appearing to anybody. Now maybe he did, but this first recorded incident of appearing to anybody. And even then, it was only after he made it to the land. Yeah. Right? Yeah. After he made it to the land. Now, I can tell you, brethren, that there are things to be seen in the kingdom of God that you need to see to make it safe to the glory. Mm -hmm. But you'll never see them until you, you get to a certain place. Yeah, Amen. yeah I'm not talking about a physical place. Uh -huh. To, to, the day you start will dawn in your heart when you're at a certain place. When you've handled what you've been given to handle and you've been faithful in what you've been right. given to do. You've separated like you said to separate. and You get to this place where that you can hear better. Amen. You can see better. Right. And he'll let you know what he's got. By that, I don't mean this takes the place of the Bible. But I mean you'll have confidence. You'll, when, he, when he tells you this, you'll have confidence. You'll, you'll connect what the scripture says with yourself. And you'll have confidence and assurance. And it, it's a lot easier to run this race when you're sure about the destination. Amen. Sure about where you're going. Yeah. Under thy seed will I give this land. Now, this is reiterated. I didn't count them here, but I had listed all the times that that very statement is made. I want to give this land to your seed. So this is a central fact in God's deal with Abraham. Well, Abraham, Abraham, what, what are you going to do now that this has happened? And there he builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. That's the first thing. Built an altar. Doesn't say he sacrificed anything. I, I don't know if he did or not, but it doesn't say he did. He built an altar unto the Lord. One time Jacob set up a stone. Stone he slept on when he had that vision of the ladder reached down from heaven, the earth, and he slept on his stone. He took the stone, it was his pillow. When he slept, he set it up as a pillar to the Lord. Then he'd come back later and he'd call on the name of the Lord at that pillar. So whether this was this kind of an altar, sacrificial altar, I don't, it doesn't say. But there is such a thing as building something under the Lord that is associated with recollection and memory. In other words, I never want to forget this spot. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Amen. This time here, I never want to forget right. it. 
Why do you think Paul did everything he could to get to Jerusalem by Pentecost? So because he wanted to just he just wanted to observe a Jewish feast. Oh, there were certain memories associated. This is where the Holy Spirit first came down. This is where the gospel was first preached. See, this there are certain places that are associated with holy recollections. Amen. You've probably been in Christ long enough. You have some of these. You you know what I'm talking about. Comes into the land and its inhabitants. Yeah, <laughs> now you can't even imagine how this must have fought against what the Lord oh, yeah. had said to That's him. Right, but this had to be confirmed, and the Lord appeared to him. It was confirmed, and he never wanted to forget that That's confirmation. Right. Amen. Brother Given, also yes. there's there's a sense that in Christ we don't have to leave that place. Yeah, that's right. We actually take something from that experience yeah, that's with good. us. As Amen. That's Amen. Amen. That's good. Amen. Amen. Abraham, Paul says, in, he, in, he hoped against hope, and that was uh, spe specifically about the promise of Isaac. Mm -hmm. But this, the, the same applies here, too, as he promised him the land, he gets there, and it's inhabited. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the assessment was still Abraham believed God. That's yeah. right. But yeah. what he saw uh, contradicted what God had said, but he chose to believe God instead of believing what he Amen. saw. Amen. Yeah. Amen. See, he's made, this is one of the places that Abraham has made a blessing. Mm -hmm. He blesses us because we can see lived out. Here it is lived out. Mm -hmm. The circumstance seems to contradict what God said. Yeah. But Abram builds an altar. <laughs> and he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. Boy, how's that for precision? And there he built an altar. He built another one. This is what they estimate me five to 20 miles. It's just not a long distance, but couldn't move very far without building another altar. Yeah. Built an altar unto the Lord and, and called mm -hmm. upon the name of the Lord. We don't know the name of the mountain he removed to. They tell us that they the mountain is still there, called Burton. I don't know, but it makes sense that he moved to a mountain from, <laughs> from that place where God appeared to you. It, it, it takes a lot of sense you'd head for a mountain after that. And uh, he built an altar unto the Lord. Now, there are a number of men who have built altars in Scripture. Noah built an altar unto the Lord. After the flood, took all the un, all the clean animals and fowls and offered them to the Lord. Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord. I'm fashioning this phrase, unto the Lord. Samuel built an altar unto the Lord. Elijah built an altar in the name of the Lord. <coughs> now these altars, they're like, they testify to you the impact of being aware of God. See, when you're aware of God, you stop what you're doing and you you do something that God's the only reason for doing it. Yeah. Amen. Built an altar unto the Lord. And then I don't question that if they ever pass by this way again, see, there'd be this holy recollection connected with that. And remember when Joshua took the children of Israel into Canaan, they were told to gather each tribe of stone out of Jordan and stack it up in the middle and your children said, what are these stones? Well, so we come over the Jordan at flood tide. We come over. We crossed over here at flood tide. Yeah, yeah Raul Willie Recollections. He called upon the name of the Lord. Now, <laughs> what, what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? That's like the word bless. You know? <laughs> yeah, you get, get to explain it. It's not, uh, it's not quite so simplistic to explain it. Call upon the name of the Lord. We know the scripture says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. <laughs> Isaiah said that, and Peter preached that at Pentecost. Whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this, this is a pretty important exercise. And Paul instructed Timothy, follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord. Yeah. You have a pure heart. To the Corinthians, he said, all day that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. See, there's that's just a calling on the name of the Lord. 
This does involve prayer, what we call invoking God. That's just petitioning God to become involved in what we're praying about, seeking his aid and help and a blessing and attention. Calling upon the name of the Lord is a, it's a verbal acknowledgement that God is the only one that can do what we're asking. And if we're thanking him, God is the only one who could have done what we're thanking him for, calling on the name of the Lord. Have you, uh, have you practiced calling on the name of the Lord? By practice, I don't, you know what I mean, do you do it? Yeah. Call on the name of the Lord. Sometimes you really don't know what the answer to a situation is. So you call on the name of the Lord. You try, it's an it's a act of faith. You're de we're depending. I'm depending on you, mm -hmm. Lord. Like he's in the land now. What do I do now? Mm -hmm. yeah. See, so he called on the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. But again, you get the picture. He moved a little distance, built another altar. <laughs> Our trek to glory should be speckled with thanksgiving. Times, oh, thank you, Lord. For letting me see that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord, for bringing me through that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord, for putting this desire in my heart. Thank you, Lord, for making me strong enough to resist the devil. Mm -hmm. Thank you for making me concerned about the people that are around me. Mm -hmm. That's the all things God does, but when you build something to the name of the call, the name of the Lord, you're acknowledging his involvement. And then it says that Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. I'll give you a little map there. That's just, he's at the area that would be given to Judah. And that part of it was called the wilderness of Judah. It was kind of a barren place. Here's some of the other versions uh, commenting on going on still. He journeyed on by stages toward the Negeb. And again, that's a transliteration of the word translated south. The southern part of Judah is how we would say it. He went and encamped in the wilderness. He made way stage by stage to the Negeb. He continued slowly southward, pausing frequently. He started out toward the southern desert. He moved on toward the Negev, stopping for a time at several places on the way, journeyed on still toward the south. See, this is the way travel is. I mean, airplanes have non-stop flights, but there weren't any non-stop walks. They had to stop along the way. Even Israel, they're wandering through the wilderness, they stay on an oasis where there's 120 palm trees and 12 wells, and they stop there, and refresh himself. See, that's, you've got to know when to stop and refresh yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah, amen. No, nobody can tell you. The fact that the early church met on the first day of the week and this sort of thing gives you an idea of a kind of the frequency of the stops, so, <laughs> yeah. so to speak. Now, the difference is that in a physical journey, when you stop, you don't make any progress during a stop, but in the spiritual stop, you may, do make some progress. Yes, the progress is you get stronger, mm -hmm. more able, more capable. I suppose that could happen in the other by nourishment. Mm -hmm. But we're going stage by stage yes. or changed from glory to glory. See, We're making our journey the same way Abram made his mm -hmm. after he got to the promised land. Remember? He kept moving after he came to the promised land. He kept on moving. Some people get to the promised land, they stop moving. Pretty soon they're over on the other side of Jordan again. Keep moving. Now you notice the nature here. And I'll, I'll close with this. Thus far we've seen... Uh, God make known things to Adam, Enoch, 
Noah, Abram. But each time there was an increase. It wasn't just like a rehearsal or a review of what was done said before. Adam, the only thing he knew was that the seed of woman would bruise the head of the serpent and the serpent would bruise his heel. That, that was it. That's all he heard. Enoch, oh, he found out that God has a certain reaction to ungodliness and to ungodly people is going to judge them. And Noah, he's the first man to have walked with, he's the second man to walk with God. And God revealed to him that as a God of judgment, he'd execute judgment on the ungodly, but he wouldn't thoroughly destroy everybody. And he, for the first time, made a promise that there'd never be anything like this again. Abram, here's the first man who was called to another area. That's <laughs> it. And we just being introduced to what was revealed to Abraham. There's going to be a lot of stuff. A lot of details. Down to measurements and all kinds of things revealed to, uh, to Abram, Abraham. And then later Moses, he'll get even more. He'll be able to fill up a book with what, what God tells him. Then the prophets, they'll hear even more. And John the Baptist, he'll... And all the while they're keeping what was... They're keeping what was revealed before, and they're, they're appending to it, adding to it. John the Baptist here more. Then Jesus, he comes into the tremendous volume of things that made known. Then the apostles, they added on more, and where it keeps on increasing. Your children should actually be able to progress further than you have. That would be this would be the ideal. This is what this is what all of us want, I think. But what I'm saying is that you have good reason to want this. You have good reason to trust the Lord that this can, this can happen. Mm -hmm. That pretty soon you're, you'll be having conversations with your children uh -huh. after they've matured some and they're able to communicate with you and they'll say something to you you never thought of before. Amen. That's the nature of the kingdom. That's, yeah. that's the nature of pilgrim life. Uh -huh. That's how it is. I yeah. see that in Tobiah and Isaac when, yeah. when I, when I uh, look at them at their age and I, and I remember me at their age oh, yeah. and I think light years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. light years it blesses oh, you too, doesn't it? Oh, when you, yeah, I <laughs> know what you mean. It's a great blessing to you to see that. You don't yeah. say, well, I wish I'd have, wish I'd have learned quicker. Yeah. You're glad they did. That's the nature of the kingdom now. All right, any of you have something you'd like to add? Yes, Brother Bob? Something that you said uh, for years now, and it's um, true, that there, you look at the book of the Revelation, and somebody says there's no new revelation there. And, and uh, the, the, every, he, everything he says there, actually the rest of the Bible will actually reveal or open up what he's talking right. about. And it's the same thing with these words that you've um, defined tonight. These were like blessing, you know. Yeah. You, you, you can't really allow the world or people who are yeah. in the world to define something that is only God can define. Yeah, amen. And, but when you really see it for what it is and, and you start seeing that it, in that same sense, you can be a blessing to other people. Well, amen. now, see, this gives you great confidence. And you enter into a circumstance mm -hmm. or a situation, and you're not born with this. You're not like when you're born into Christ, you know everything about everything. That isn't the way it is. You, you, you actually are increasing in, 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 in the knowledge of the Lord and making these applications is part of, the, of, of growing up in the Christ. Amen. And so I appreciate um, uh, these definitions, uh, like the, when you did divine nomenclature and, and a few of the other series. You know, the, this isn't something we were able to benefit and grow a lot faster because of your labor. And because you've seen it throughout the years, but you put it together in a concise way. And see, this is, it, we can help each other by doing these kinds of things yes. for each other. Amen. You know, and you, you mentioned something in the car on the way over to men's meeting. You said you, well, you went through the trouble of putting this all together so others wouldn't have to. Yeah. Well, see, but this is almost lost oh, in the world today. Yeah. You know, it, but see, you labor in order that you can be a blessing and help other people yeah. because now when other people see it, then they'll be a blessing to you. That's right. So it won't fall on 
You know, that's the whole point. Yeah. Paul preached and he was able to be blessed by those that he taught later on when they came up. Like Timothy, can you imagine what a blessing Timothy was to Paul? Yeah. But if he hadn't extended himself, he wouldn't have. Yeah. Some people said refreshed him. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they, this is God's manner. He told Moses after he's up on the mount, write this in a book. Yes, amen. He told Jeremiah, write it in a book. Mm -hmm. he told Isaiah, write it in a book. Why? To pass it on. That's right, amen. Amen. Those who see, they run. Yes. That's right, amen, uh -huh. amen. amen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now we can see uh, Abraham actually increasing and growing because oh, now when yeah. after the Lord appeared to him, now we we hear Abraham calling on the name of the Lord. Yes, right. So this is his right. first time he was at Ford. First time, Amen. Amen. And you know you you brought this out already, but that uh, you were saying that now God, uh, it's a certain level that God is able to reveal Himself with different men. So yeah. so for example, now when he when he gets to Moses. He will have been at a certain level where he yeah. can pick it up with yeah. each man. Yeah. Uh, he gets to a certain point, and, that, and, and as another man comes along, he's able to start at that point. Amen. He doesn't have to good. You know, back good. up. Amen. Amen. So he's actually increasing. Yeah, yeah. This word you gave on altars being, being built up so that you don't forget. You know, illumination does that for you. Amen. There are certain intersections I remember. I'll never forget uh, that uh, men's retreat we had at Christ Church yes. of Orinoco. I remember being on stage after having played with the brethren in the band. My brother Aaron came up, and I began to talk about how Scripture was starting to make more sense to me. And he's the, he was the first one to open up the fact of the day dawning. Yeah. I had never even... Mm -hmm. Thought, I was just telling my experience, and yeah. I didn't connect with scripture, but he did, and I'll never forget exactly where I was yeah. when he said that. And I've got a lot of those kind of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. but now, see, yeah. the remembrance of those locations brings back That's all right. the things associated with That's that right. illumination. Yeah. And I remember you saying one time, it's good to have like a place where you continually retire. Jesus oh, had the yeah. Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. You can That's imagine right. the flood of memories yeah. Yeah. that oh, came yeah. to Jesus that night. He needed strength to prepare to yeah. die. <laughs> where did you find him? In that place, he oft mm -hmm. resorted there. Yeah, so that's that's good to have those kind of yeah. places. Amen. That was also Amen. the place where Abraham and Isaac had walked. And where that's David right. Had walked. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. On those hills. Yeah, that pillar Bethel yeah. that Jacob read became a key point. That's right. In history, that's yeah. right. Then with David, the threshing floor in Jerusalem finally built there. You know. Yeah. This is just my own consideration, but I. And I'll give it as that. But um, every time I read this about um, about um, the Abraham, God brought him out after his father died. Yeah. It, it, occurred, it occurred to me as I was thinking about that, that there's a sense in which God wasn't going to bring Abram any further until his father was gone. Now, And, mm -hmm. I, and I think it's in my own understanding is because men would have attributed that and said, see, his father really brought him in. Yeah. It, but his father didn't. No. He, it, was, it was after that, after his father died, there was a, a more complete separation from the things yeah. that, that he told him. Now, you know, I'm not saying that it was wrong for his father. <coughs> he made, you know, and like I said, it's, it's all speculation. It's all just my own yeah. thinking about it because we don't have a verse on it. But um, uh, uh, Stephen did mention this that it and because there's two commas in between there after his father died yeah and so he it was it was almost as though the uh, journey was interrupted now whether or not his father was sick or whether you know he was he, they had to stop for that i don't know but it it was he did make a point of it that he didn't go any further until his father died yeah Thanks. according to uh the things that we talked about in the past. Now Stephen was able to do what the preachers. Yeah. He was able to clear this up. Yeah. Amen. He, actually, he opened it up. Uh -huh. That's right. Uh, for us, he, he, right. he saw exactly what really happened. That's right. In fact, of Mesopotamia. They had a grasp. See, they had a grasp of of scripture. That's right. Yeah. All right. We'll have a word of prayer.